Babur, born Zahiru Din Muhammad, was the founder of the Mughal Empire and first emperor of the Mughal dynasty in the Indian subcontinent. He was a descendant of Timur and Genghis Khan through his father and mother respectively. He was also given the posthumous name of Ferdas Makani. Of Shagatai Turkic origin and born in Andijan in the Fergana Valley, Babur was the eldest son of Umar Sheikh Mirza and a great-great-grandson of Timur. Babur ascended the throne of Fergana in its capital Iksakan in 1494 at the age of 12 and faced rebellion. He conquered Samarkand two years later, only to lose Fergana soon after. In his attempt to reconquer Fergana, he lost control of Samarkand. In 1501 his attempt to recapture both the regions failed when Muhammad Shaybani Khan defeated him. In 1504 he conquered Kabul, which was under the putative rule of Abdur Razak Mirza, the infant heir of Ulya Beg II. Babur formed a partnership with the Safavid ruler Ismail I and reconquered parts of Turkestan, including Samarkand, only to again lose it and the other newly conquered lands to the Shibanids. After losing Samarkand for the third time, Babur turned his attention to India and employed aid from the neighboring Safavid and Ottoman empires. Babur defeated Ibrahim Lodi, Sultan of Delhi at the First Battle of Panipat in 1526 CE and founded the Mughal Empire. At the time, the Sultanate at Delhi was a spent force that was long crumbling. The Mavar Kingdom, under the able rule of Rana Sangha, had turned into one of the strongest powers of northern India. Sangha unified several Rajput clans for the first time after Prithviraj Chauhan and it advanced on Babur with a grand coalition of 100,000 Rajputs. However, Sangha suffered a major defeat in the Battle of Kanwa due to Babur's skillful positioning of troops and modern tactics and firepower. The Battle of Kanwa was one of the most decisive battles in Indian history, more so than the First Battle of Panipat, as the defeat of Rana Sangha was a watershed event in the Mughal conquest of northern India. Babur married several times. Notable among his sons are Humayun, Kemran Mirza, and Hindal Mirza. Babur died in 1530 in Agra and Humayun succeeded him. Babur was first buried in Agra but, as per his wishes, his remains were moved to Kabul and reburied. He ranks as a national hero in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Many of his poems have become popular folk songs. He wrote the Babarnama in Shagatai Turkic, it was translated into Persian during the reign of his grandson, the Emperor Akbar. Zahiru Din is Arabic for defender of the faith, and Muhammad honors the Islamic prophet. The name was chosen for Babur by the Sufi Saint Khwaja Akrar, who was the spiritual master of his father. The difficulty of pronouncing the name for his Central Asian Turko-Mongol army may have been responsible for the greater popularity of his nickname Babur, also variously spelled Babur, Babar, and Babur. The name is generally taken in reference to the Persian word Babur, meaning tiger. The word repeatedly appears in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh and was borrowed into the Turkic languages of Central Asia. Thaxton argues for an alternate derivation from the Pi word beaver, pointing to similarities between the pronunciation Babur and the Russian Babur. Babur bore the royal titles Bansha and al Sultanu el Azam wa el Haqan al Makaram Padshah Ghazi. He and later Mughal emperors used the title of Mirza in Gurkhaniya's regalia. Babur Family Tree 17th century portrait of Babur Babur's memoirs form the main source for details of his life. They are known as the Babarnama and were written in Shagatai Turkic, his mother tongue, though, according to Dale, his Turkic prose is highly Persianized in its sentence structure. Morphology or word formation and vocabulary. Babarnama was translated into Persian during the rule of Babur's grandson Akbar. Babur was born on February 14, 1483 in the city of Andijan, Andijan province, Fergana Valley, contemporary Uzbekistan. He was the eldest son of Umar Sheikh Mirza, ruler of the Fergana Valley, the son of Abu Sa'id Mirza and his wife Kulfnigar Khanum. Daughter of Yunus Khan, the ruler of Mogulistan. Babur hailed from the Barlas tribe, which was of Mongol origin and had embraced Turkic and Persian culture. They had also converted to Islam centuries earlier and resided in Turkestan and Khorasan. Aside from the Shagatai language, Babur was equally fluent in Persian, the lingua franca of the Timurid elite. Hence, Babur, though nominally a Mongol, drew much of his support from the local Turkic and Iranian people of Central Asia, and his army was diverse in its ethnic makeup. It included Persians, ethnic Afghans, Arabs, as well as Barlas and Shagatayid Turko-Mongols from Central Asia. In 1494, 11-year-old Babur became the ruler of Fergana, in present-day Uzbekistan, 
after Umar Sheikh Mirza died while tending pigeons in an ill-constructed dovecote that toppled into the ravine below the palace. During this time, two of his uncles from the neighboring kingdoms, who were hostile to his father, and a group of nobles who wanted his younger brother Jahangir to be the ruler, threatened his succession to the throne. His uncles were relentless in their attempts to dislodge him from this position as well as from many of his other territorial possessions to come. Babur was able to secure his throne mainly because of help from his maternal grandmother, Isan Dalit Begum, although there was also some luck involved. Most territories around his kingdom were ruled by his relatives, who were descendants of either Timur or Genghis Khan, and were constantly in conflict. At that time, rival princes were fighting over the city of Samarkand to the west, which was ruled by his paternal cousin. Babur had a great ambition to capture the city. In 1497, he besieged Samarkand for seven months before eventually gaining control over it. He was 15 years old and for him the campaign was a huge achievement. Babur was able to hold the city despite desertions in his army, but he later fell seriously ill. Meanwhile, a rebellion back home, approximately 350 kilometers away, amongst nobles who favored his brother, robbed him of Fergana. As he was marching to recover it, he lost Samarkand to a rival prince, leaving him with neither. He had held Samarkand for 100 days, and he considered this defeat as his biggest loss, obsessing over it even later in his life after his conquests in India. For three years, Babur concentrated on building a strong army, recruiting widely amongst the Tajiks of Badakhshan in particular. In 1500-1501, he again laid siege to Samarkand, and indeed he took the city briefly, but he was in turn besieged by his most formidable rival, Muhammad Shaybani, Khan of the Uzbeks. The situation became such that Babar was compelled to give his sister, Khanzada, to Shaybani in marriage as part of the peace settlement. Only after this were Babar and his troops allowed to depart the city in safety. Samarkand, his lifelong obsession, was thus lost again. He then tried to reclaim Fergana, but lost the battle there also and, escaping with a small band of followers, he wandered the mountains of Central Asia and took refuge with hill tribes. By 1502, he had resigned all hopes of recovering for Ghana, he was left with nothing and was forced to try his luck elsewhere. He finally went to Tashkent, which was ruled by his maternal uncle, but he found himself less than welcome there. Babur wrote, During my stay in Tashkent, I endured much poverty and humiliation. No country, or hope of one. Thus, during the ten years since becoming the ruler of Fergana. Babur suffered many short-lived victories and was without shelter and in exile, aided by friends and peasants. Coin minted by Babur during his time as ruler of Kabul. Dated 1507 eighths Kabul was ruled by Babur's paternal uncle Alia Begtu, who died leaving only an infant as heir. The city was then claimed by Mukinbig, who was considered to be a usurper and was opposed by the local populace. In 1504, Babur was able to cross the snowy Hindu Kush mountains and capture Kabul from the remaining Argonauts, who were forced to retreat to Kandahar. With this move, he gained a new kingdom, re-established his fortunes and would remain its ruler until 1526. In 1505, because of the low revenue generated by his new mountain kingdom, Babur began his first expedition to India. In his memoirs, he wrote, My desire for Hindustan had been constant. It was in the month of Shaban, the sun being in Aquarius, that we rode out of Kabul for Hindustan. It was a brief raid across the Khyber Pass. Babur leaves for Hindustan from Kabul in the same year, Babur united with Sultan Hussein Mirza Baykara of Herat, a fellow Timurid and distant relative, against their common enemy, the Uzbek Shaybani. However, this venture did not take place because Hussein Mirza died in 1506 and his two sons were reluctant to go to war. Babur instead stayed at Herat after being invited by the two Mirza brothers. It was then the cultural capital of the Eastern Muslim world. Though he was disgusted by the vices and luxuries of the city, he marveled at the intellectual abundance there, which he stated was filled with learned and matched men. He became acquainted with the work of the Shagatai poet Mir Ali Shir Navai, who encouraged the use of Shagatai as a literary language. Navai's proficiency with the language, which he is credited with founding, may have influenced Babur in his decision to use it for his memoirs. He spent two months there before being forced to leave because of diminishing resources, it later was overrun by Shaybani and the Mirzas fled. Babur became the only reigning ruler of the Timurid dynasty after the loss of Herat, and many princes sought refuge with him at Kabul because of Shaybani's invasion in the west. He thus assumed the title of Pacha among the Timurids, 
Though this title was insignificant since most of his ancestral lands were taken, Kabul itself was in danger and Shabani continued to be a threat. Babur prevailed during a potential rebellion in Kabul, but two years later a revolt among some of his leading generals drove him out of Kabul. Escaping with very few companions, Babur soon returned to the city, capturing Kabul again and regaining the allegiance of the rebels. Meanwhile, Shabani was defeated and killed by Ismail I, Shah of Shia Safavid Persia, in 1510. Babur and the remaining Timurids used this opportunity to reconquer their ancestral territories. Over the following few years, Babur and Shah Ismail formed a partnership in an attempt to take over parts of Central Asia. In return for Ismail's assistance, Babur permitted the Safavids to act as a suzerain over him and his followers. Thus, in 1513, after leaving his brother Nasir Mirza to rule Kabul, he managed to take Samarkand for the third time, he also took Bukhara but lost both again to the Uzbeks. Shah Ismail reunited Babur with his sister Khanzada, who had been imprisoned by and forced to marry the recently deceased Shabani. Babur returned to Kabul after three years in 1514. The following eleven years of his rule mainly involved dealing with relatively insignificant rebellions from Afghan tribes, his nobles and relatives, in addition to conducting raids across the eastern mountains. Babur began to modernize and train his army despite it being, for him, relatively peaceful times. The meeting between Babur and Sultan Ali Mirza near Samarkand the Safavid army led by Najm e Sani massacred civilians in Central Asia and then sought the assistance of Babur, who advised the Safavids to withdraw. The Safavids, however, refused and were defeated during the Battle of Ghazdjuan by the warlord Ubaidullah Khan. Babur's early relations with the Ottomans were poor because the Ottoman Sultan Salim I provided his rival Ubaidullah Khan with powerful matchlocks and cannons. In 1507, when ordered to accept Salim I as his rightful suzerain, Babur refused and gathered Kizilbash servicemen in order to counter the forces of Ubaidullah Khan during the Battle of Ghazdjuan. In 1513, Salim I reconciled with Babur, dispatched Ustad Ali Kli the artilleryman and Mustafa Rumi the matchlock marksman, and many other Ottoman Turks, in order to assist Babur in his conquests. This particular assistance proved to be the basis of future Mughal Ottoman relations. From them, he also adopted the tactic of using matchlocks and cannons in field, which would give him an important advantage in India. Babur's coin, based on Bal al Lodi's standard, Kila Agra, on 936 Babur still wanted to escape from the Uzbeks, and he chose India as a refuge instead of Badakhshan, which was to the north of Kabul. He wrote, In the presence of such power and potency, we had to think of some place for ourselves and, at this crisis and in the crack of time there was, put a wider space between us and the Strong foeman. After his third loss of Samarkand, Babur gave full attention to the conquest of North India, launching a campaign. He reached the Chenab River, now in Pakistan, in 1519. Until 1524, his aim was to only expand his rule to Punjab, mainly to fulfill the legacy of his ancestor Timur, since it used to be part of his empire. At the time, parts of North India were part of the Delhi Sultanate, ruled by Ibrahim Lodi of the Lodi dynasty but the sultanate was crumbling and there were many defectors. Babur received invitations from Dalit Khan Lodi, governor of Punjab and Alauddin, uncle of Ibrahim. He sent an ambassador to Ibrahim, claiming himself the rightful heir to the throne, but the ambassador was detained at Lahore, Punjab, and released months later. Babur started for Lahore in 1524 but found that Dalit Khan Lodi had been driven out by forces sent by Ibrahim Lodi. When Babur arrived at Lahore, the Lodi army marched out and his army was routed. In response, Babur burned Lahore for two days, then marched to Dibalpur, placing Alam Khan, another rebel uncle of Lodi, as governor. Alam Khan was quickly overthrown and fled to Kabul. In response, Babur supplied Alam Khan with troops who later joined up with Dalit Khan Lodi, and together with about 30,000 troops, they besieged Ibrahim Lodi at Delhi. The Sultan easily defeated and drove off Alam's army, and Babur realized that he would not allow him to occupy the Punjab. Mughal artillery and troops in action during the Battle of Panipat in November 1525 Babur got news at Peshawar that Dalit Khan Lodi had switched sides, and Babur drove out Alauddin. Babur then marched onto Lahore to confront Dalit Khan Lodi, only to see Dalit's army melt away at their approach. Dalit surrendered and was pardoned. Thus within three weeks of crossing the Indus River Babur had become the master of Punjab. Babur marched on to Delhi via Sirhind. 
He reached Panivat on April 20, 1526 and there met Ibrahim Lodi's numerically superior army of about 100,000 soldiers and 100 elephants. In the battle that began on the following day, Babur used the tactic of Tulugma, encircling Ibrahim Lodi's army and forcing it to face artillery fire directly, as well as frightening its war elephants. Ibrahim Lodi died during the battle, thus ending the Lodi dynasty. Babur wrote in his memoirs about his victory, By the grace of the Almighty God, this difficult task was made easy to me and that mighty army, in the space of a half a day was laid in dust. After the battle, Babur occupied Delhi and Agra, took the throne of Lodi, and laid the foundation for the eventual rise of Mughal rule in India. However, before he became North India's ruler, he had to fend off challengers, such as Rana Sangha. Babur encounters the Jain statues at the Urba Valley in Gwalior in 1527. He ordered them to be destroyed. The Battle of Kanwa was fought between Babur and the Rajput ruler of Mavar, Rana Sangha, on March 16, 1527. Rana Sangha wanted to overthrow Babur, whom he considered to be a foreigner ruling in India, and also to extend the Rajput territories by annexing Delhi and Agra. He was supported by Afghan chiefs who felt Babur had been deceptive by refusing to fulfill promises made to them. Upon receiving news of Rana Song's advance towards Agra, Babur took a defensive position at Kanwa, from where he hoped to launch a counterattack later. According to K. V. Krishna Rao, Babur won the battle because of his superior generalship and modern tactics, the battle was one of the first in India that featured cannons and muskets. Rao also notes that Rana Sangha faced treachery when the Hindu chief Salati joined Babur's army with a garrison of 6,000 soldiers. Babur recognized Sangha's skill in leadership calling him one of the two greatest non-Muslim Indian kings of the time, the other being Krishnadevaraya of Vihayanagara. This battle took place in the aftermath of the Battle of Kanwa. On receiving news that Rana Sangha had made preparations to renew the conflict with him, Babur decided to isolate the Rana by inflicting a military defeat on one of his staunchest allies, Medini Rai, who was the ruler of Malwa. Upon reaching Chandarai, on January 20, 1528, Babur offered Shamsabad to Medini Rao in exchange for Chandarai as a peace overture, but the offer was rejected. The outer fortress of Chandarai was taken by Babur's army at night, and the next morning the upper fort was captured. Babur himself expressed surprise that the upper fort had fallen within an hour of the final assault. Medini Rai organized a Johar, during which women and children within the fortress immolated themselves. A small number of soldiers also collected in Medini Rao's house and proceeded to kill each other in collective suicide. This sacrifice did not seem to have impressed Babur who did not express a word of admiration for the enemy in his autobiography. In a letter Babur wrote to his son Humayun, O my son! The realm of Hindustan is full of diverse creeds. Praise be to God, that he has granted unto thee the empire of it. It is but proper that you, with heart cleansed of all religious bigotry, should dispense justice according to the tenets of each community. And in particular refrain from the sacrifice of cow, for that way lies the conquest of the hearts of the people of Hindustan, and the subjects of the realm will, through royal favor, be devoted to the dot and the temples and abodes of worship of every community under the imperial sway, you should not damage. Dispense justice so that the sovereign may be happy with the subjects and likewise the subjects with their sovereign. The progress of Islam is better by the sort of kindness, not by the sort of oppression. Babur defeated and killed Ibrahim Lodi, the last sultan of the Lodi dynasty, in 1526. Babur ruled for four years and was succeeded by his son Humayun whose reign was temporarily usurped by the Suri dynasty. During their 30-year rule, religious violence continued in India. Records of the violence and trauma, from Sikh Muslim perspective, include those recorded in Sikh literature of the 16th century. The violence of Babur in the 1520s was witnessed by Guru Nanak, who commented upon it in four hymns. Historians suggest the early Mughal period of religious violence contributed to introspection and then in the transformation in Sikhism from pacifism to militancy for self-defense. According to Babur's autobiography, Babarnama, his campaign in northwest India targeted Hindus and Sikhs as well as apostates. And an immense number were killed, with Muslim camps building towers of skulls of the infidels on hillocks. There are no descriptions about Babur's physical appearance, except from the paintings in the translation of the Babarnama prepared during the reign of Akbar. In his autobiography, Babur claimed to be strong and physically fit, and that he had swum across every major river he encountered, including twice across the Ganges River in North India. Unlike his father, he had ascetic tendencies and did not have any great interest in women. In his first marriage, 
he was bashful towards Aisha Sultan Begum, later losing his affection for her. Babur showed similar shyness in his interactions with Babri, a boy in his camp with whom he had an infatuation around this time, recounting that, occasionally Babri came to me, but I was so bashful that I could not look him in the face, much less converse freely with him. In my excitement and agitation I could not thank him for coming. Much less complain of his leaving. Who could bear to demand the ceremonies of fealty? However, Babur acquired several more wives and concubines over the years, and as required for a prince, he was able to ensure the continuity of his line. Babur crossing the Indus River Babur's first wife, Aisha Sultan Begum, was his paternal cousin, the daughter of Sultan Ahmad Mirza, his father's brother. She was an infant when betrothed to Babur, who was himself five years old. They married eleven years later, c. 1498-99. The couple had one daughter, Fakran Nissa, who died within a year in 1500. Three years later, after Babur's first defeat at Fergana, Aisha left him and returned to her father's household. In 1504, Babur married Zainab Sultan Begum, who died childless within two years. In the period 1506-08, Babur married four women, Maham Begum, Masuma Sultan Begum, Gulruk Begum, and Dildar Begum. Babur had four children by Maham Begum, of whom only one survived infancy. This was his eldest son and heir, Humayun. Masuma Sultan Begum died during childbirth, the year of her death is disputed. Gulruk bore Babur two sons, Kamran and Askari, and Dildar Begum was the mother of Babur's youngest son, Hindal. Babur later married Mubaraka Yusufzai, a Pashtun woman of the Yusufzai tribe. Gulnar Agacha and Nargal Agacha were two Circassian slaves given to Babur as gifts by Tomast Shah Safavi, the Shah of Persia. They became recognized ladies of the royal household. During his rule in Kabul, when there was a time of relative peace, Babur pursued his interests in literature, art, music and gardening. Previously, he never drank alcohol and avoided it when he was in Herat. In Kabul, he first tasted it at the age of 30. He then began to drink regularly, host wine parties and consume preparations made from opium. Though religion had a central place in his life, Babur also approvingly quoted a line of poetry by one of his contemporaries, I am drunk, officer. Punish me when I am sober. He quit drinking for health reasons before the Battle of Kanwa, just two years before his death, and demanded that his court do the same. But he did not stop chewing narcotic preparations, and did not lose his sense of irony. He wrote, Everyone regrets drinking and swears an oath, I swore the oath and regret that. The identity of the mother of one of Babur's daughters, Gulruk Begum is disputed. Gulruk's mother may have been the daughter of Sultan Mahmud Mirza by his wife Pasha Begum who is referred to as Saliha Sultan Begum in certain secondary sources. However this name is not mentioned in the Babur Nama or the works of Gulbadan Begum, which cast doubt on her existence. This woman may never have existed at all or she may even be the same woman as Dildar Begum. Babur had several children with his consorts, sons daughters Babur and his heir Humayun Babur died in Agra at the age of 47 on 5th of January, OS December 26, 1530, 1531 and was succeeded by his eldest son, Humayun. He was first buried in Agra but, as per his wishes, his mortal remains were moved to Kabul and reburied in Bagi Babur in Kabul sometime between 1539 and 1544. Babur Square, Andijan, Uzbekistan in 2012 it is generally agreed that, as a Timurid, Babur was not only significantly influenced by the Persian culture, but also that his empire gave rise to the expansion of the Persianate ethos in the Indian subcontinent. He emerged in his own telling as a Timurid Renaissance inheritor, leaving signs of Islamic, artistic literary and social aspects in India. For example, F. Lehman states in the Encyclopedia Iranica, his origin, milieu, training, and culture were steeped in Persian culture and so Babur was largely responsible for the fostering of this culture by his descendants. The Mughals of India, and for the expansion of Persian cultural influence in the Indian subcontinent, with brilliant literary, artistic, and historiographical results. Although all applications of modern Central Asian ethnicities to people of Babur's time are anachronistic, Soviet and Uzbek sources regard Babur as an ethnic Uzbek. At the same time, during the Soviet Union Uzbek scholars were censored for idealizing and praising Babur and other historical figures such as Ali Shir Navai. The tomb of the first Mughal emperor Babur in Kabul Babur is considered a national hero in Uzbekistan. On February 14, 2008, 
stamps in his name were issued in the country to commemorate his 525th birth anniversary. Many of Babur's poems have become popular Uzbek folk songs, especially by Shirali Jurayev. Some sources claim that Babur is a national hero in Kyrgyzstan too. In October 2005, Pakistan developed the Babur cruise missile, named in his honor. Shaincha Babar, an Indian film about the emperor directed by Wajahat Mirza was released in 1944. The 1960 Indian biographical film Babar by Heman Gupta covered the emperor's life with Kajan on Jagirdar in the lead role. One of the enduring features of Babar's life was that he left behind the lively and well-written autobiography known as Babar Nama. Quoting Henry Beveridge, Stanley Lane Poole writes, his autobiography is one of those priceless records which are for all time, and is fit to rank with the Confessions of Street. Augustine and Rousseau, and the memoirs of Gibbon and Newton. In Asia it stands almost alone. In his own words, the cream of my testimony is this, do nothing against your brothers even though they may deserve it. Also, the new year, the spring, the wine and the beloved are joyful. Lover make merry. For the world will not be there for you a second time. Tombstone of Babur in Bagi Babur, Kabul, Afghanistan. The Babri Masjid in Ayodhya is said to have been constructed on the orders of Mir Baki, one of the commanders of his army. In 2003 the Allahabad High Court ordered the Archaeological Survey of India to conduct a more in-depth study and an excavation to ascertain the type of structure beneath the mosque. The excavation was conducted from March 12, 2003 to August 7, 2003, resulting in 1360 discoveries. The summary of the ASI report indicated the presence of a 10th-century temple under the mosque. The ASI team said that, human activity at the site dates back to the 13th century BCE. The next few layers date back to the Shunga period and the Kushan period. During the early medieval period, a huge but short-lived structure of nearly 50 meters north-south orientation was constructed. On the remains of this structure, another massive structure was constructed, this structure had at least three structural phases and three successive floors attached with it. The report concluded that it was over the top of this construction that the disputed structure was constructed during the early 16th century. Archaeologist K.K. Muhammad, the only Muslim member in the team of people surveying the excavation, also confirmed individually that there existed a temple-like structure before the Babri Masjid was constructed over it. The Supreme Court judgment of 2019 held that there is nothing to prove that the structure, which was destroyed before the construction of the mosque, was a temple and that the remains of the structure was used for its construction. Thanks for watching.